My name is Rob Whitaker. Most people just like to call me Rob. My only desire is to help you understand the most important question on earth. Where am I going when I die? As the title of this program indicates, Back to the Bible, we are going to take you to the Bible and the Bible only for the answer. Now, every scripture will be displayed on the screen for you to read and find the answer. Now, let's get started. Our first section in our study is titled, Our Authority in Religion. Here, Jesus says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, in this passage, what makes you free? Well, Jesus says, the truth will make you free. Now, this is going to be the type of study that you're going to undergo as you watch this video. We're going to present to you a verse of Scripture, and you will find the answer right in the Bible. Hence, we call this Back to the Bible. Now, let's go to John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus tells us that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. You got it. Let's go to the next one together. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So what is truth? It's a good question. I think many people would struggle to find the answer if they didn't have a Bible. But right on your screen, you can read the answer. The answer is the word of God. Notice John 14 23 through 24. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. I know that's a long passage, so let's take our time and find just one answer. The teaching of Jesus, where did it come from? How did he get it? Well, the teaching of Jesus was from the Father. It's right at the end of the passage. So Jesus gets all that truth from his Father. Our next passage is Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, to whom also he made the worlds. So today, how does God speak to us? Well, today, God speaks to us through His Son. Notice what His Son said in John chapter 3, verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. So God has given how many things into the hands of Jesus? That's right. He has given all things into His hands. Now, Let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So, Jesus has all what in heaven and earth? The text says it. He has all authority. Now, since Jesus has all authority, watch what happens in John 17, 2, while he's praying. Jesus says, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. So, Jesus 
has authority over what? He has authority over all flesh. Now, when we take that teaching and apply it to the writings of the Apostle Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23, he wrote, And he hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So God has made Jesus to be the head over all things to the church. So does this mean Jesus has all authority over the church? Well, of course it does. If he has authority, if he's the head, that means he has all the authority over the church. And our next passage, John chapter 12, verse 48 I want you to listen carefully to what Jesus says. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has one who judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. At judgment, we will be judged by the words of who? Well, the passage is very clear. We're going to be judged by the words of Jesus. He's speaking these words. Now, that's an important teaching. Consider, at the end of our life, as we're looking at eternity, Jesus and his words are going to be the standard of our judgment. So, therefore, we want to know what he says. Now, as we move forward, and consider what Jesus said in John 6, 68. This is an exciting passage. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Who has the words of eternal life? Well, Simon is speaking to the Lord. So Jesus, the Lord, he has the words of eternal life. Notice our next question. Should we go to anyone else, parents, preachers, relatives, friends for eternal life? Of course, the answer is no. If Jesus has all authority and we are directed to go to Jesus for eternal life, we need to stick with what Jesus said. Now, as we move to our next section in this study, the Holy Spirit guided the apostles into all the truth. Let's notice what Jesus said in John 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Did Jesus say the Holy Spirit would teach them, that is the apostles, all things and bring all that Jesus said to their remembrance. If we go back to the Bible, we have to say yes. So when the apostles taught by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were they teaching their own words or the words of Jesus? Well, the answer is self-evident. It's right in the text. It requires us to say that they were teaching the words of Jesus. I want you to go to the next passage, John 16 and 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will guide the apostles into how much truth? You got it. It's all the truth. Have you noticed some of the key words in our study? For example, the word truth has been emphasized over and over again. The word all has been emphasized again and again. 
Now, these passages we're reading are very important. I want you to go back to a setting in time when you didn't have a Bible, when Jesus was actually saying these words. The only way those who received these words could give them accurately because they did not have a Bible would be with some assistance. This assistance came in the form of the Holy Spirit. His mission was to remind the apostles of all the truth that Jesus taught. Now, when you go to the third verse of Jude, it becomes very clear why this is important. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I find it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, was the faith delivered in the lifetime of the apostles? If you go back to the Bible, you're going to have to say yes. In fact, Jude wrote, it was once for all delivered to the saints. So since the apostles were guided into all religious truth in their lifetime, should we expect to receive any new revelation today? Well, the answer would be no. If they got all the truth, if they received all truth from the Holy Spirit, there's nothing new that we're waiting on today. Now, in our next section of study, we're going to look at the inspired word as our only guide in religion. In John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, the Bible says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. That is a powerful passage. Have you ever wondered about some of the things that Jesus did in his life? Maybe as he was a small boy, a teenager. I mean, we only have a few years of his life recorded. This passage explains why. Because these things are written that you might what? Believe that Jesus is a son of God and that you might have what? Life in his name. So all the recordings about Jesus are so that we can believe and have life in his name. That is so comforting. As we continue, let's go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So these things are what? Go back to the Bible and you can find your answer. They're written. Now, why are they written? They're written that you may know you have eternal life. How reassuring this passage is to all who are interested in salvation. Because the Bible was written so that we can know things. My friend, you can know if you have eternal life. You know this by reading the written Word of God. Now, the Word of God says in Romans 10, 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So how does faith come? Well, the passage says hearing. We need to hear the Word of God. In James 1.21 the Bible says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So what's able to save your souls? 
It's the implanted word. It's not just having a Bible, but you've got to implant the word. That's the purpose of this study. We're trying to implant the word in our life. As we continue in 1 Peter 1, 23, the Bible says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So how is one born again? Now, I know you might be tempted to give an answer that you've heard, or perhaps someone else has demonstrated or told you about in their life. But I'm asking you to go back to the Bible. According to this passage, how is one born again? It says, by the Word of God. So, should you go to any other source to learn how to be saved? Well, I hope your answer is no. Because if we go to the Bible, and the Bible only, we're going to get the right answer. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, there are several questions we're going to ask about this passage. Does the Bible thoroughly furnish us unto every good work? Well, if you go back to the Bible, you'll see the answer must be yes. Now, do we need additional revelations, additional instructions to make us complete before God? We're asking, do you need something in addition to the Scripture? Again, going back to the Bible, you'd have to say no. I'm going to apply this teaching with some specific examples. Do we need the Book of Mormon to make us complete spiritually? Well, the answer must be no. You can insert any book, and the answer is always going to be no if it's not the Bible. Do we need church tradition, church manuals, creed books, confessions of faith, to make us complete spiritually? Once again, the answer has to be no. So we do not need anything other than the Bible. In 2 Peter 1, 3, the Bible says, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Has God given us all things that pertain to life and godliness? Well, the text says that he has given us all things. So the answer must be yes. Now let's make another application. Since God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in the Bible, should any other source be used as our religious authority? The answer has to be no. Since God has given us all things, we should not use any other source as our religious authority for instruction, only the Bible. Now, let's move into the next section of, of our study. We must not add to or take away from God's Word. Now, you will see that this principle is given in both Old and New Testament, going all the way back to the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep his commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Would you please God if we added to or deleted anything from his word? Well, the answer is no. Now, in the New Testament, we find a very similar teaching. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, but since that's a long rendering, I'm going to condense it 
Notice what it says. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. You'll find in this reading that if someone changes, even if it's a spiritual being from what you have in the Bible, that God has placed a condemnation on them. Will we be accursed if we add to or take away from the Bible? And the answer must be yes. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, will provide an example of what will happen if we add to or take away from the Bible. The Bible says the Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, and they offered a profane fire before the Lord, which he had commanded them not, or he had not commanded them. These men offered a strange fire before the Lord, which he what? Now look at the end of the text. He had not commanded them. So he had not instructed Nadab and Abihu to do this, but they decided to do it anyway. So did they alter God's commandments? Absolutely they did. Now did this please God? Was God pleased with them? God was not pleased. In fact, in verse 2, it said, And the fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. So must we be careful how we handle the Word of God? Well, the answer must be yes. Now, that's a picture of what happens to those who add to or take away from the Word of God. Now, let's go to 2 John 9, and let's look at a passage in the New Testament about this teaching. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So, if we do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, is God pleased? Well, the answer is no. Do you want to please God? Give that some thought. It's very important as we're looking at the topic of what's going to happen when I die. In Matthew 15 and 9, Jesus said, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, their worship to God was unacceptable. But why? Because they taught for doctrines the commandments of men. God does not want us to substitute man's commandments for his. Now, let's look at Matthew 7, 21. This is another powerful statement made by Jesus. I want you to think about it carefully. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, who will be allowed to enter heaven? Look at the passage. It says, He who does the Father's will. Now, the question must be asked, do you want to go to heaven? I assume, since you're watching this program, the answer, again, must be yes. Now, let's go to the last section of our study. We are under which law? Now, I know we've already read Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, but let's read it again. God, who at various times and in various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers by prophets, 
has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Now, God formally gave his revelation to the fathers by the what? The prophets. That's right. It's in the text. That's how God used to speak to us, by prophets. But today, through whom does God speak? That's right. It says his son. So notice the contrast. He used to speak through prophets, but today he speaks through his son. Now let's apply a few other passages that we've already examined. Matthew 28, 18, remember Jesus came and spake to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, do you remember how much authority God gave him? That's right. It was all. He's got all authority. In John 12, verse 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word which I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Whose words are going to judge us. We will be judged by the words of Christ. Jesus spoke this passage. His words are going to judge us. Therefore, we move forward to John 1, 17 and find that Jesus said, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That is so comforting. Moses gave that Old Testament law. But Jesus, he gave us grace and truth. So the law was given by who? Moses, that's right. And grace and truth, who gave us these things? That's right, it was Jesus. Now, in Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, these verses will help us understand how Jesus teaches us today. Where do we find all of these teachings? Now, the passage reads, and for this reason, he, that's Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now, in that verse, there's a word, it's mediator. Perhaps you are unfamiliar with it. So let me quickly define it. A mediator is a go-between, one who stands between two. So you have a conflict, and you need someone to come in between to bring the two sides together. So, Jesus is identified as the mediator in this passage. Now, the question is, is Jesus the mediator of the New Testament? Well, that's what the passage says. He's the mediator of the New Covenant. Now, the next question is, when did the New Covenant of Jesus go into effect? Well, it went into effect when he died. If you were to write a last will and testament, your covenant, when would that covenant go into effect? Now, if you were to write a covenant and include me in it, I could not come and collect the covenant, the testament, the things you've willed to me until you died. So, just like today in the Bible, When did the New Testament of Jesus go into effect? It's when he died. Now, in Hebrews 8, 6 through 7, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, 
then no place would have been sought for a second. The question is, is Jesus the mediator of a better covenant? If you go back to the Bible, you've got to say yes. So if that first covenant, the Old Testament, had been faultless, would God have given us the second covenant, the New Testament? Well, the answer is no. So let's notice Hebrews 8.13, in that he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now that which is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So when God gave the new covenant, did he make the first one old, no longer in force? The answer has to be yes. You're learning something new. Many people do not understand the difference between the Old and New Testament. But these Bible passages are so clear, aren't they? As we move forward to Acts 13, 38 through 39, notice it says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him everyone who believes is justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Question, could we be justified by the law of Moses? If you went back to the Old Testament and followed the law of Moses, would you be justified? Well, the answer is no. Now, let's look at Galatians 3, 11 through 13. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The question is very simple. Look back in the passage. Is the law of faith? Well, the passage says the law is not of faith, so we have to say no. Next question. Did Christ redeem us from the curse of the law? Again, back to the Bible, it says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So, therefore, the answer must be yes. In Colossians 2 and 14, the Bible says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So when was the handwritings of requirements wiped away? Look at the text. At the very end, you'll find an answer. It's when Jesus was nailed to the cross. When Jesus died, those Old Testament writings were taken out of the way. In Ephesians 2, verse 15, Paul continued this teaching by saying, "...having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances." so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. So the question is, what did Jesus abolish in his flesh? Go back to the Bible and you'll see the answer. The law of commandments. Notice, he abolished the law of commandments. Galatians 3 23 through 25 makes it even more clear. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. Have you ever had a tutor? Perhaps you struggled with 
English, math, or some other school subject, and you needed someone to assist you. And so a tutor provided you additional instruction. I want you to think about that as you think about the passage. Now that faith has come, are we under the law? Now, the passage refers to the law as a tutor. A tutor prepares you, gets you ready for something to come. Now, you don't take the tutor with you when you take a test. The tutor remains behind. Now, that faith has come, do we still need the tutor? Are we under the law? The answer is no. In Romans 7, verse 4, Paul said, Therefore, that's a concluding thought, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Paul says, you also have become dead, dead to the law through the body of Christ. Brethren, if something is dead, it has no power, has no life, it has no authority. Paul says we became dead to that Old Testament law. How did he say that happened? To the body of Christ. Let's go just down a couple of verses. Romans 7, verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Paul says, now we have been what? Look back in the text. He says we have been delivered, delivered from the law. In verse 4, he says it was dead. In verse 6, he says we've been delivered. So there is one obvious question that we need to ask as we conclude our first lesson together. Take the totality of what you've learned and let's apply it. Is the New Testament, the law, spiritually binding today? Let's go back to the Bible. And when you take the totality of what you've learned, you have to say yes. Isn't that exciting? Perhaps you entered this study and you didn't know that. You knew that there were two testaments, an old and a new. Perhaps you thought you were under both of them. Perhaps you didn't think it mattered. But what you've learned in this study is that it does matter, and that we need to know what law we're under. And we're under the law of the New Testament today. Now, I want you to visualize what you've learned in this study. What we've done is created a map to God. How do we get to God? If you review, this is what you've learned. You've learned that all truth started with God the Father. Now, notice the word all, because we emphasize that in our study. He took all that truth, the Father, who did he give it to? Well, we learned in our study he gave it to the Son. Now that the Son has all the truth, what did the Son do with all that truth? We well, gave it to the Holy Spirit. So now that the Holy Spirit's got all the truth, what did the Holy Spirit do to all the truth? Well, the Holy Spirit gave it to the apostles. When the apostles got all that truth, what did they do to that truth? They wrote it down. Therefore, you've got the Bible. As we concluded our study, we noticed that the Bible contains an Old and New Testament. We learned that we're not under the Old Testament, that when the apostles wrote all of this down, they wrote it down in the New Testament. So in review, let's look at the following. Number one, the teaching of Jesus was from God. Number two, Jesus received all authority 
from God. That authority extends throughout heaven and on earth. We learn that Jesus has authority over all flesh. We learn that Jesus has authority over the church. And we learn that we will be judged by the teachings of Jesus. Number four, we learned that the apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit in what they taught and wrote. Number five, we learned the inspired word is our only guide in religion. Number six, we learned that we must not add to or take away from God's word. Finally, number seven, we learned the New Testament is the law which we are under and by which we will be judged. Now that you've completed the first study, I hope you've enjoyed it. You've learned that we're just going back to the Bible. All the answers came right out of the text. No opinions. We didn't talk about what our family or friends have told us. We just ask, what does the Bible say? I hope you're ready for the next lesson. Our second study together is going to look at the kingdom of God. We're going to look at what Jesus taught, what the New Testament teaches about being a member of the kingdom of God. What does the kingdom look like? How can we identify the kingdom? I hope you'll spend some time studying with us again we're grateful for the time you've already spent, and we believe that this study will bless your life. Thank you for listening.